Here's where I'm going to start. Most people here by now, Mike, should know how passionate and serious you are about the threat of climate change. In fact, as some of you will be aware, you just wrote a book about it with Carl Pope, yep. Climate of Hope. President Trump just withdrew the United States from the Paris Accord. Tell us about the conversations you've had in the days since then with fellow leaders in business and in government. Are they as angry as you are? Well, I think there are three big problems that the world has to worry about. One is climate change, because you can destroy every living thing. Two is nuclear war, which come back on the radar because of North Korea. You could destroy an awful lot of the world. And three, um, job destruction from technology, which is destabilizing the world. Uh, climate change is something it's easy to do something about because we know how to do it. I don't know what you do about North Korea. I don't know what you do about creating jobs, at least the number that we're going to need around the world. But climate change, if you stop putting crap into the air, uh, the air is not going to, the, the planet's not going to absorb as much heat from the sun. It will reflect more off and the temperature won't go up. And unfortunately, you get in this cycle of the higher the temperature, the more re the less reflection there is because the ice caps melt and all that sort of stuff. Um, I don't know why Trump did what he did. Um, he changed his mind, and there's nothing wrong with changing your mind. I think it's a, a sign of somebody that's uh, willing to learn and intelligent if you find some, that you made a mistake and you want to do something different. In this case, um, he didn't have to stick to his word because he's got a pattern of changing a lot of things. He could have gotten away with uh, sort of fudging it and letting uh, us stay in the Paris Agreement uh, because the polls, but the polls are overwhelmingly around the world and across America in favor of doing something about climate change. Over the last five years, it's gone from most people or a lot of people not believing that climate change is happening or not thinking that it's man-made to, yes, it's happening, we got to do something about it. And why have they changed? Because they see pictures of the ice caps melting. You see pictures of these big swaths of trees through the Rockies all dead because the beetles killed them, beetles that used to get killed with warmer uh, colder winters, not the, the oceans, the storms. We have droughts where we used to have floods, and floods where we used to have droughts, and that sort of thing. Um, and it's really hard to find very many people outside of those that have a big vested interest uh, in not doing something to, to support what Trump did. Um, ExxonMobil is advertising uh, to uh, do something about climate change. They're the biggest energy producer, um, arguably polluter, if you want to go downstream, in the country and maybe the world and certainly the country. Um, and if they're in favor of doing it, what's the advantage for Trump to do it? And everybody that I've talked to has said, whether they're governors or mayors or um, people in industry or individuals, why on earth did he do this, and is there something we can do without him? And the truth of the matter is the United States is halfway towards its COP21 goals already. We don't have to get there, at least according to the agreement, until 2025, although the earlier you get there, the better it is. But uh, the truth of the matter is we're halfway there already. No thanks to our federal government. Obama basically did a few things, um, so, some regulation stuff that can easily be rolled back or not really followed. But the federal government didn't do anything. The state governments didn't do anything. The reason we're halfway to our goals is because local governments and corporations and individuals have brought down the amount of stuff we put in the air, mainly through forcing the closure of half of all the coal-fired power plants in America. And that made an enormous difference. We're the only industrial country in the world that has done anything so far. There's some of them are starting, but nobody is remotely close to where we are in terms of accomplishments. And so for the president to walk away from it, number one, it's not going to make that much difference. We will still continue to go and get coal-fired power plants to close and get people to paint their roofs white so they use less energy in cooling their house and get more fuel-efficient cars and all of those kinds of things that we've been doing. So that raises at least a couple of questions for me. Um, following Trump's announcement, Bloomberg Philanthropies announced that in partnership with some others, it's going to make up the $15 million. Well, I say the, the U.S. government, as part of the deal, owes $15 million 
to this umbrella organization that keeps track of it. And other countries also have their share. Uh, I don't know whether the federal government is going to honor its commitment. You can't get out of COP21 for three or four years if you follow the rules. But if you don't follow the rules, all bets are off anyways. And I said, if they, they should not worry about where their money is going to come from. Worst case, Bloomberg Philanthropies will give them the $15 million. This year, we're going to give away $700 million, a lot of it in climate change stuff. So another $15 million is not that big a deal. And will we syndicate it? If you called up and you said you wanted to help, we'd be happy to take your money. We'll, do, we'll give it to the Sierra Club and let them use it. So you're also behind this new idea called America's Pledge, a coalition, not a new idea, but a new name, let's say. Yeah. Uh, this coalition of states, cities, um, and companies united in fulfilling the commitments made in Paris. What gives you the confidence, Mike, that this group can be successful in spite of the administration's position? Well, it's, it's hard to uh, do less than the last administration did. Really? I mean, that's I told you. Uh, Obama did basically nothing. That administration did almost nothing. All of this was done by the private sector and local governments, city governments. And so we can just continue. And really, you know, America's pledge is a nice rubric for what we're trying to do. But in, in the end, it's still people downwind from the local power plant going and picketing and saying, I don't want my kids to breathe the air that you're, you're polluting. I don't, uh, you know, I, and, and for them, the owners of the power plants to say, my God, renewables have become competitive for the first time without federal subsidies mm -hmm. and frack natural, nat, nat, natural gas. Um, is a better alternative than burning coal. Can I go back to the point that you made about ExxonMobil? Because I think there's some room for confusion here, not by the yeah. point that you made, but by what people observe and perceive. On the one hand, you have ExxonMobil, Conoco, BP, Total, and a number of other oil companies right. reaffirming support for Paris. And on the other hand, you do have this government, not the last government, but this government, trying to breathe life into the coal industry. Well, it's not going to happen trying to take steps to roll back the clean power plan to weaken toxic emissions rules, as well as gut the EPA's budget. All, and this is where the contradiction comes into play, all presumably at the behest of lobbying organizations that are backed by industry, energy intensive industry or yeah. energy in and of itself. So the question we may all be asking ourselves is what does big business really want? Who do you believe? Do you believe Darren Woods when he says we're behind uh, Paris? Or do you believe, is it, is it a question of watch what they do, not what they say? Well, now look, uh, companies have to um, continue to make money and please their stockholders. They work for the stockholders. Um, but if you take a look at Exxon, what they see is they're going to have to be in the renewables business because that's what gonna, is going to power everything. And they have to... Uh, uh, find ways to use their products and things other than just burning them to create heat to in turn generate electricity. Um, and incidentally, nobody's ever going to be perfect on everything. They can belong to organizations and those organizations don't always do everything mm -hmm. that they want. I think it's fair to say that for ExxonMobil to stand up, lead the charge, get these other guys to, to sign up with them is a very big step and a slap at the administration to say, wait a second, we cannot continue doing what we're doing. We're going to destroy the planet. And ExxonMobil said, and we'll figure out how to make a living afterwards. But you just have to do this. So let's go back to America's pledge for a moment. This coalition of cities, states, and companies. How will you define success? Well, we're going to meet the goals that were set and negotiated. And what somebody has to explain to the president is the uh, COP21 was really designed to help these other countries um, and uh, to do what we need them to do. We are the beneficiaries when another country cuts back on its emissions. And we are hurt when they don't or when they increase the thing about the world is it's all, everybody in the world breathes the same air. And so if China doesn't reduce their uh, pollutants, we get hurt. If China does, we benefit. Now, the truth of the matter is the two countries that are leading the charge after America on reducing the pollutants in the air are China and India. They are the biggest pr um, uh, uh, producers of greenhouse gases 
And both governments have recognized that they cannot survive as governments if they don't do something. The people have just risen up in arms and said, I can't see across the street. My kid can't go out. And so they're going to do something about it. And they've already canceled a lot of coal-fired power plants, a lot of closings and steel mills and cement plants, which also are very damaging uh, to the economy. And this business of, well, we shouldn't do it unless they do it. Number one, they're doing it. And number two, even if they don't do it, we still have to do it because we're the beneficiaries. If they don't want to help themselves, they'll hurt their own people and they'll hurt us. But that is no logical argument why we should then say, OK, we'll go continue to kill our people as long as they're killing their people. It's just nonsensical. <laughs> I said that one time. It was a House Select Committee. I was out in Seattle. There were four mayors testified. And then four Democrats, two Republicans. Sesson Brenner was one of the Republicans. I forget the other guy's name. And it was a House Select Committee. Select committees, if you don't know, they can't introduce legislation. They're there so they can get PR so that they can get stories in the paper for their homegrown, their home uh, constituencies. And this uh, one, the two Republicans said, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, we're not going to stop polluting unless you stop, pollu uh, unless the China stops polluting. And I said, Congressman, you're saying we should continue to kill our people because they're killing that people. That's the stupidest F-U-C-K-I-N-G <laughs> reason I've, I've ever heard. And by now, everybody in the audience, all environmentalists, are on their chairs screaming, go for it, go for it. And the guy picked up his briefcase and stormed out. <laughs> we, we did not bother to call to apologize, because I don't think it would have been accepted. Um, <laughs> speaking of constituencies, let's address this constituency right here. You were appointed by Mark Carney, who happens to be the governor of the Bank of England. But in this particular case, How can a Canadian capacity, be the head of the Bank of England? I can never figure that out, but that's OK. <laughs> he likes the job. He does. Uh, he also happens to be the head of the Financial Stability Board. Yeah. And in that capacity, he appointed you to chair a task force looking at climate change from a market perspective. So let's put climate change in perspective for investors. Why should they care? Well, if you're a company, it's hard to recruit people, the best and the brightest, certainly, if you're not environmentally friendly. Kids out of the better schools, the ones that you're really at heart, the way there's a big shortage, like in STEM, uh, all want to know what you're doing for the environment. So it's a very big deal for companies to try to uh, create the impression, hopefully true, that they are active in the causes that young people care about, one of which is certainly climate change. Two, the employees and the customers of big companies care about what those companies do, and sometimes they'll boycott if they're a customer or uh, go to another place to, to work if, they, if the company doesn't do that. And lastly, uh, the investors care. Uh, the big pools of money, uh, pension funds and endowments, that kind of uh, org organizations, they want their, uh, the beneficiaries want the money to be invested socially responsible ways. And so a lot of the big managers, when they sit down with management, uh, want to know what you're doing in the environment before they even ask about earnings. So that's why transparency and uh, disclosure well, are it, so Yeah, I mean, the whole idea of the Carney thing, and we have an American version of that, is you can see what other com com companies are doing, mm -hmm. and that puts pressure on you to, because otherwise people are going to say, well, if they can do it, you've got to do it. The but, sunlight disinfectant. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. It's hard to show in social investing that it really makes a big difference in your return, plus or minus. But in this case, these uh, the money managers say our people don't want us to invest in companies that are uh, uh, killing us. Mike, I'm going to use the words climate and environment in another sense. The political climate in Washington, people older than me say, is like nothing the country has experienced since Watergate. Do you agree? Um, not in my lifetime uh, have we seen this. I don't know if you go way back whether it was more vicious and more nonsensical and more partisan than it is today. But certainly in our lifetime, what's changed is social media and transportation, I guess. Transportation because now everybody in Congress comes on Tuesday morning, leaves Thursday night. They spend their weekends at home talking to their constituents, trying to raise money. During the week when they're in Washington, the junior ones are all sent to an office building, which both parties have one, and given lists of who to call. And they spend all their days calling. And if they're needed for a vote, they'll get them back. And you know, you say, well, how do they influence legislation? There's, you have no ability to influence legislation if you're a junior congressman or a first-term senator. Uh, getting power only comes with longevity. 
And uh, so uh, that's what they do. And they don't get to know each other. So that's why a lot of this partisanship, it used to be they'd live in Washington and their kids would go to the same schools and they'd meet at PTA meetings and they'd go to dinners together and they'd build a relationship. Today you go to the Senate uh, dining room, Republicans and Democrats would never share a table. Just wouldn't share a table in this day and age. There'd be so much pressure from the others in their party if they even if they wanted to. How is this vicious, in your words, climate um, having an impact on the business? Well, it's hard to get legislation passed, and uh, some legislation we need, some we don't. Um, but uh, the one thing business needs is certainty uh, for almost every business. This is a few exceptions. But just tell me what the law is, and I will figure out how to work with it. What I can't deal with is not knowing what the law is going to be tomorrow, whether it's employment law or trade uh, legislation or taxing, uh, regulatory stuff. As you may remember, uncertainty was a rallying cry for the political opposition and, to a large extent, the business community during the certainly the latter part of the Obama administration. Is there more or less uncertainty today? I suppose, well, you've got a new president um, who is still trying to staff up um, and figure out what uh, he wants to do and what is possible given the bureaucracy's ability to stall things and Congress's ability to, uh, inability to pass certain legislation and the courts getting in the way of some changes. Um, so it, it's just, there is more uncertainty because of that. And I think there's more uncertainty because of social media and some of those things mm. where you get a lot of different input than uh, from what you did before. And then you have other things going on in the world. Um, you know, the uh, nine dash line for China, the North Korean mm. uh, nuclear rocket program, um, climate change, and the disruption of, of j jobs going away. You spoke to the president in the days after the election? Once, two weeks after he got elected. Have you spoken to him since? No, Do you have any contact with him? I don't, I mean, given, if he called, I'd be happy to take the call. He wouldn't call. What he would do is send a message he'd like to get a call. That's the protocol that they, I, I mean, I, I can dial the number myself. I don't even have to have a secretary do it. I, I don't live in that world. but. Uh, if he did, I'd be happy to talk to him. If he asked me my advice, I'd be happy to give it to him. I think it's relatively unlikely that he is going to call. <laughs> but, but if he did, we are, for the record, on a first-name basis. I mean, I've cut ribbons with him in New York City. I played golf with him 10 or 15, 12 years ago. Donald Trump, Billy Crystal, Joe Torrey, and myself, two years in a row in a charity tournament. Joe Torrey's mother was an abused woman, and so he has a charity that raises money, and I remember we did that for two years. Did Donald uh, cheat? No, everybody had five balls in the air and we had lots of <laughs> jokes and, you know, that was uh, quite a fun them. stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, and I had dinner with him once uh, about uh, 20 years ago, literally 20 years if ago. If there's one piece of advice you would give him, what would it be? you got to staff up with good, competent people that uh, have knowledge of what they're doing. Forget about the ideology. And it, that's not the what. So far, uh, very few of the people who he needs have been selected and almost none have been vetted or have been uh, approved. Um, he sent out a tweet the other day, two days ago, I guess, uh, complaining that Democrats weren't, uh, were slowing down the approval of his nominations to be ambassadors. Uh, a minor problem the Washington Post pointed out. He didn't really appoint anybody so far, but other than that, it's, I mean, he appointed 12 out of 50 and had sent paperwork up for virtually none. What about the people around him? Gary Cohn, Steve Mnuchin, Wilbur Ross, do you have contact with those? Uh, Gary ones? Cohn, uh, I know very well, he's a smart guy, tough guy. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, I've shaken his hand twice his, to show my age. His father was my competitor. He ran the block <laughs> desk at, at Goldman when I ran the block desk at Solomon Brothers. Um, so I'm his father's age. And his father's pretty liberal. I don't think they talk politics. So I don't, don't really know him. Tillerson, uh, Tillerson, I don't know, but you don't get to be the head of Exxon without being stupid, or being stupid. You don't get, you know, without, being, without having a lot of experience. And uh, Mattis, I do know very well, and uh, he's a competent guy. Uh, it is... Wilbur Ross is also a competent guy. And Wilbur's going to focus on, unlike Peggy Pritzker, who did a very good job, Peggy focused on, a uh, Penny, not Peggy, Penny Pritzker focused on... Uh, small business mm -hmm. and Wilbur's expertise and inclination, I think, is probably to focus on big business. I was he going seems to, say, to have the president's ear. 
Pardon me? He seems to have he the presidency. Presidents here. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say it's hard to make predictions right now. Um, no, it's easy to make them. It's hard to be right. Okay, so I'll challenge you to be right. What do you think is going to happen between now, in Washington, in the White House, in Congress, between now and the midterms? Well, common sense says at the midterms, the uh, in-party loses seats. Um, it's hard to see the Republicans losing the Senate because there's 25 Democrats and only eight Republicans up for re-election or open seats. Uh, on the uh, House side, they could easily lose the... Uh, control of the House. Would that make it harder to pass legislation? I don't know whether it would be. It, it's very hard to get that group together. Um, it'd be hard with the Democrats, too. The Democratic Party's being torn from the left, the Republicans from the right. Um, we did something really stupid. Uh, we got rid of, uh, I don't know what they call them, not Lulu's, uh, earmarks, I think it is mm -hmm. in the federal government. Every level of government does the same thing, but they have different names for it. Um, it was a very effective ways for a manager to run a group. And you can say it's bribery. Yes, it is bribery, but it, the world is, you do me a favor and I will do you a favor. What favor can you do a congressman? Well, you give them some money to have the local YMCA's roof fixed. That's what it does. It didn't really hurt anybody. It was a trivial amount of money. And without that, it's really very hard to corral mm. all these people. And the country suffers for it. So the good government people were very proud of what they did, but the unintended consequences were very bad. And that's one of the th reasons why the leadership can't pull people together on both think, sides of the aisle. Do you think the president makes it through his four years? Yeah, unless he has a heart attack, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, he's 70 years old. What's the, uh, what's the odds on a seven-year-old man having a heart attack? Um, it's not inconsequential, 5% or something like that, just as guess. But um, assuming he's healthy, he's not going to get impeached. He was elected by 63 million, I think it was, people voted for him. They're not going to take away the person that they picked. He won the election fair and square, maybe with a little help from the Russians, but hey, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, but, but uh, he's not going to get impeached. You'd have to have something so egregious with so much uh, proof. And mm -hmm. even then, I'm not so sure. His supporters voted for him for a reason. Some of them are going to be very disappointed because he couldn't possibly deliver what he promised, but they wanted a change. And you see that around the world. And it comes from what I said, talked about with the job destruction. Uh, it comes because of social media. There are a few things that are different today than were... Uh, than they were uh, eight years ago, 12 years ago, whatever. And um, uh, he's the beneficiary of that. He's also going to be the uh, hurt by that because people are going to say, what a second you promised, or there are new needs that nobody ever talked about and he can't deliver. It's really hard to see how we get lots of legislation through. Um, if you think about it, we have we don't have the three parts of government that really matter here, all in the hands of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. The Senate's in the hands of the Republicans, the House is in the hands of the Republicans, but the president's not a Republican, and the party rented a candidate, and the candidate rented a party, and that's not a good sign. That, that doesn't give you a warm and fuzzy feeling that they're gonna be able to pass legislation. Before we run out of time here, Mike, um, here's a question about this group of people. You've been serving the investment community for more than 50 years. Sorry to remind you. Started in 66. I'm um, happy about it. I hope it goes <laughs> a lot longer. Yeah. First, of course, at Solomon and since 1981 here at Bloomberg LP. How have you seen the buy side change? Well, the size of the, the, of the amount of monies are just, uh, I was talking to Bill Gross backstage and when we started in the business, nobody talked about billions. I told him a story, Solomon Brothers, somebody demanded that we make a two-sided market in the long treasury and uh, they asked how big it is, and the partner who was in charge of the desk said, you know, screw him, we're as big as he wants to be. And he sold us 100 million bonds, and we weren't sure we could finance it that night. Today, it'd be an odd lot. Um, so there's that. There's a lot of technology that's being used. Um, there's the focus on passive investment, but I, I am 100% convinced that that is only because the stock market has done nothing but go up since 08 in a straight line. And if any money manager knew that it was going to do that, you'd just buy S&P ETFs and go play golf. 
Uh, but at some point in time, that stops. And then that's when you want to hire people for active management. And 2 and 20, if that's what you got to pay, 3 and 30, anything that gets you alpha, you got to do that. Right now, the, the, the active managers have less ability to uh, distinguish themselves. And so people use them less. That's what capitalism is all about. But that's going to come back. And we will use a lot more technology from satellite, whether uh, cars in McDonald's parking lots or more in the morning versus at lunchtime, uh, stuff like that. Does it really help? A lot of it's Freakonomics. A lot of the AI stuff gives you results like that. Uh, in the end, there's a lot of uncertainty. Nobody knows why markets overnight all of a sudden uh, pay attention to facts that have been there for a long time and that mm -hmm. nobody paid attention to. I've been a bear for the last half a dozen years. Um, every time there's another disaster around the world, I think, oh my God, the market's going to react. And it hasn't reacted. I don't know why. But one of these days it will. And then everybody's going to say it's going to go down forever. What happens is typically the bull markets last for much longer than the uh, bear markets, which tend to be sharper and more precipitous. Um, and that's probably going to happen again. And the market, the banks will come back and they'll add more traders and more salesmen and uh, they'll do everything they did before. These cycles, I've watched it a number of times, and the unicorns concept is going to, you know, go away. I mean, you have to have, in, in, when I first started uh, in, I think it was in the late 60s, you had uh, technology companies coming and as soon as they made money, uh, the market, uh, the stock collapsed. Because until then, it was all pie in the sky. You could put any number on a multiple on, on zero that you wanted. Once the multiple applied to real earnings, and you say it's worth how much, and then they walked away, you'll have that again. Uh, I think it's fair to say one, at least one of the reasons that the people in this room are here today is that they either use the Bloomberg, they watch TV, Bloomberg radio, TV. Well, they if they the don't news. have a Bloomberg, we're taking names, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Um, that being the case, how are we working to help them solve their problems and meet their challenges? What are we doing? Well, I think every company should do what I like to think we do. Um, and that is you want to, the conventional wisdom is listen to your customer, and you should. They, the, the, you owe them the courtesy of that, and sometimes they have good ideas. But generally speaking, the customer and the salesman, this is true of every business, is comfortable with what they have today. They're not very good necessarily at knowing what they're gonna to need tomorrow. And even if they thought about it, they'd be scared to even let it into their minds. That's what happened to Kodak. They saw uh, uh, the, the camera in, in the cell phone and they didn't do anything. Now, whether they could have gotten in, I don't know, but they didn't even try. There are lots of examples of businesses that overnight, I think uh, the credit card business is under gonna be under attack because um, it's, you can transfer funds so quickly for, without any friction, hard to see how you're going to charge to do that. Um, so there are those kinds of things that um, uh, are, are uh, changing. But what we've got to do is try to figure out what you're going to need tomorrow, build it, and then convince you to buy it. Um, and that's what I, in government I would call that leading from the front rather than leading from the back. If companies just try to replicate other companies' products, by the time they get out there, the other guy's first mover advantage, and in any case, the market's walking away from those products to the next best thing, you've got to find a ways to anticipate the next best thing and do that. And we try to do that. Um, so, you know, we collect data before people need to ask to use it. Um, and things that you'd never thought anybody would care about, but it turns out that a lot of times the market comes towards you, and we've been not right every time, but a lot of that. Same thing with uh, ways to distribute data, same thing in ways, uh, what data, uh, how you do the calculations and different kinds of uh, displays, um, and uh, it's, it's no different in our business. We have, we're in a good position, but there are plenty of competitors out there uh, who are working very hard. We don't have a lock on all the good ideas or all the good people. And if we were to take our eye off the ball and slow down and rest on our laurels, that's, that's, what, that, that's the way companies destroy themselves. Mike, I'd like to thank you, and I hope everyone agrees with me. That was a great way to start thank off you. Bloomberg Invest. Thank you for coming, everyone.